This episode of Thinking Tackle is in association with Daiwa Infinity Rods. Perfect. Welcome to Thinking Tackle. My name is Danny Fairbrass, and in this show, we're fishing at Oxley's on the Linear Complex in Oxford. There's six different day ticket lakes spread all around this area, all run by the same people, and all with loads of really big fish in them. Um, this particular lake we reckon is about 20 acres, and uh, Mr. Broad here, who's fishing with me, say hello, Mr. Broad. <laughs> um, he reckons there's about 2,000 carp in here. Um, I reckon there's 500 20s and 30 to 50 30s. Plus, obviously, loads and loads and loads of doubles. I'm just flicking this spot up the surface. And we're going to fish contrasting styles. You'll see Mr. Broad's making up some method balls over there. He's going to fish with a method feeder. I'm spotting and just fishing little tiny baits over the top and we're going to go for all the different rigs and everything that we're using and the baits and obviously we're going to be having a look at uh, Mr Broad's method mixes because there is an art to fishing the method and uh, I haven't done it very much so I'm obviously going to be very interested in what he's doing but what I'm doing at the moment is just ringing the dinner bell as we say and putting the spot out it's about a hundred yards which is a fair bit further let's get this out there out she goes. It's a fair bit further. It's just hit the clip there. The most people fish on here, and that's going to be the key. We're just creating a baiting spot, keep putting bait in, keep putting bait in. We're told it's a night water rather than a day water, so I'm sure we'll get some action tonight, and hopefully that will continue on into the morning. But once I put three or four spot folds out, we're going to go straight into that bucket. I'm going to make up another mix and show you what's inside. We're going to have a look at the spot mix now and it's a little bit different from anything that I've used in any other show because of the type of water we're on. Um, but I'm going to start with my Old Faithful chilli hemp. Really, really spicy stuff. Fish absolutely love that. So one of those is going to go straight into my bucket. Juice and all. Carp absolutely love spicy things so you can always spice your own hemp up a little bit if you want to. And then also some of that party mix. And the thing that's good about that, if I pour a little bit of that in there, and we get down to the, the bigger bits, I don't know if you can see that there, but there's bits of maize in there, there's small maple peas, there's loads of stuff that I could use as a hook bait, and I've actually got maize on two of the fishing rods at the moment. Um, and that's a fantastic bait all through the year, but particularly in the summer, really, really good bait. So that goes in there, so I've got some bigger food items. And then with it, the old faithful sweet corn, Absolutely superb stuff. You find the fish going to be picking little bits of that out over the top of the spot mix. Absolutely love that. So a whole tin of corn into it. And then we'll give that bit of a mix up. There's still some bait in there from earlier on. We're a few hours into the session now and I've already put out about 25 spot falls, I suppose. Maybe a little bit more. It's very windy to start off with. So I wasn't as accurate as I'd like to be. Um, so we'll just give that a good old mix round. And you can see in that mix... There's a few little extra things, which I'm going to talk to you about now. And that's it. Magwars. Loads and loads of maggots. I've brought 
16 pints of maggots, two gallons with me, because maggots are really, really effective on here, especially in the winter time. They've absolutely murdered this place. So that's why I've got them in the mix as well. And we are going to show you later on in the show some maggot rigs and some rigs for using the maize as well to fish over the top of it. Now, looking at these ones, if I bring both out together, just hold those over there. You see, one lot of those are very, very lively and the other lot appear to be sleeping. Um, and that's because I've uh, just put them into a long sleep on the bank by adding a little bit of boiling water to them. Now, you can kill maggots in loads of different ways. Now you put them in the freezer for a couple of days, but I've only bought these yesterday, and if I put them in the freezer overnight, they miraculously come back to life when they thaw out. Um, you need to leave them in the freezer for two or three days to actually kill them properly. So to do it quickly on the bank, all you do is literally put them into a bucket of water like I've got there, with just a little bit of water just covering them, and then just add boiling water to them, and it heats the water up to, the, to a right temperature and then they're, they're sort of wriggling around and you keep adding the hot water, keep adding the hot water and all of a sudden, boom, they all die. Now if you put boiling water straight onto them, they go horrible and pasty and they don't look nice at all. So by doing this, it's a little trick the match anglers showed us, by just adding boiling water to normal water, it will bring the temperature up to exactly the right temperature to kill all the maggots and bang, that's done. So I'm just going to add a few more maggots into my mix like so. If they're alive, you don't want to be keeping them in water because it makes them float. But once they're dead, it doesn't make any difference at all. Oh, get that good old mix round. I should think tonight, if I get a few bites, I could easily get through that bucket of bait. As I said, I put about 20 spodfuls out to start off with, and I've just done sort of four or five every couple of hours just to keep more bait falling through the swim. Now, as that is there, like that, I'm going to lose some of that out the back of the spod when I'm chucking it out there, and it's going a long way, so I don't want to be losing anything out the back of it at all. So, to add to it a little bit of ground bait, that will just stodge it up enough. This special G stuff's got loads of fish meal in it, which the match angler's really, really rate. So I'm just adding that to it, just to stodge it up a bit, so I don't lose any out the back of the spod. Again, give that a good old mix round. I've avoided putting pellets in this on purpose, and that's because they end up going to mush the pellets. They draw all the water in that the hemp's got in it, and they go to mush, and one, you get covered in pellet mush, and also, it just forms a cloud in the water and never actually gets to the bottom. And basically, the longer the session goes on, the more it goes to mush, and the more it sort of sticks in the spod, and when you cast them long away, you want the, the bait to come out of the spod really, really quickly, and just by adding a bit of ground bait like that, it's stodgy enough to stay in the spod, but it will still release really, really quickly. And obviously everything barring that ground bait will get to the bottom. And the ground bait will give you a nice little cloud over the top of the baited spot for a few minutes as well. So added attraction. So that is the mix. Absolutely super, super carpy. Well, we are into our first carp. Doesn't feel very big, it's moving very quickly. Oh, it feels a bit bigger now. Um, off the baited spot. We were gonna do Steve's bait, but uh, the rain has stopped us doing it. And uh, I'm into my very first Oxley's carp, which I hopefully is gonna go in the net. I'm sure it'll be the first of many. And I'm just gonna keep Adding food to the swim now. Nice boil up on the surface there. And I would imagine it's just going to get better and better and better. The old swans are coming in for a look. He's right under my feet now. Not a very big one, but he's the first one. And that's all that matters. I'm sure in the morning we're going to uh, show you Steve's method mixes and I'm sure there'll be quite a few more fish to show you as well. Oh, my net's over there. Look 
Come here, baby. Come on. Right, let's just creep forwards. Get in the net. Yes. Come on, the first one. Excellent. And there we have it, 20 pounds, eight ounces, my first Oxley's carp. Well pleased with that, I'm sure it'll be the first one of many. Steve's gonna persevere on with the, the method feeders, keep whacking those out, I'm sure he'll start to get bites as well. I've got two other rods still on the spot, so I'm sure they're gonna go as well at some point. I'll get this rod back out there once I've got this fella back. But what a lovely start to the session. My first 20 pounder from Oxley's, wicked. Well, welcome back to Thinking Tackle. Um, I've had a very quiet night's fishing. Just one aborted take. Um, I was in the back of the swim answering the call of nature and uh, the take went off then. So uh, I had to finish what I was doing and uh, get to the rod and picked up the rod. The fish had kited at a fair distance and uh, it just came off straight away. I just took too long to get to the rod really. Um, and that was it. Um, we're going to go over to Mr Broad's swim and have a look at his method mixes um, and this one has just roared off literally oh it came towards me quite quickly and then roared off away took loads of line which it's doing again now look at that loads of line oh it's really going now now it's deep in here and uh, Mr Broad hasn't got any um, back leads on so I'm, what I'm trying to do is keep the fish underneath his lines because it's kited over to the right. So I'm keeping the rod tip down nice and low. I'm back leaded so I can drag the fish back towards me, hopefully underneath Steve's lines. I don't know exactly where it is at the moment, but the nice thing is I can drag it towards my lines because they're pinned down to the bottom and uh, away from his. That's kited right over the top of those lines now. Feels quite a good fish, actually. He's an angry one, that's for sure. Just wallowing around now. Oh, banging his head. There he is. Good 20. Come on, baby. Get in the net. Yes! Come on! Excellent. Top result. That is a real good fish, that. That's a 30 pounder, not a 20 pounder, definitely. Wow, what a beast. And there we have it. 32 pounds, four ounces of stunning, stunning mirror carp. Look at that, what a beast of a fish. And there's 50 more of these like this in here and about 520s behind them and a load of doubles behind that as well. Pucker, this is gonna be a real big one one day. Look at that. <sighs> right, let's get him back, get over to Broadly Swim and start investigating those method mixes. Well, we finally got round to Mr. Broad Swim uh, to talk method mixes. Um, there's loads of stuff here, mate. So first of all, go go with the most simple. So if someone's never done a method before, 
what should they be using? Uh, the simplest and easiest to do, Dan, is just simple pellets. Right, let's have a look at those. Get you, those out so everyone can see it. Right. Right. Now, you might not think that you can do a great deal with those. Rock hard and all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Yep. But it's very, very simple. Okay. Kettle full of warm water, not boiling water, because if you use really hot water, it breaks them down too quickly. Okay, right. So, quite literally, one of the mistakes people make is put too much liquid yeah. in. So, just a bit of a covering, give it a good swoosh around, and you can see from that how they're all nice and shiny. Right, yep. There's no excess water in at all, no excess water in the bottom, they're just nice and shiny. Right, just give them a coating, basically. Just, just a coating, and right. then... Here comes a really complicated bit. Lid on. Lid on, yep. and that's done. We'll leave that now for about an hour, hour and a half, and it sort of prepares itself. It steams because of the heat that's still in there, yep. and it softens up. What I've done is I did some earlier just so I could show you properly. True. Blue Peter style. Yeah, we've we got everything earlier. ready. <laughs> We're always prepared. I was a Boy Scout, I was. And if you look, the pellets have still got the shape. Right. You know, you look at them, they're all still formed and pellet shaped. Yep, yeah. Lovely. And that is, you know, it'll stick to anything. And right. we've got a method feeder here just to show you. Okay. Um, I've left a rig on, it's just a pellet shaped hook bait to match everything right, you're now, doing. Th this is something you take for granted. Why is that a pellet shaped hook bait? Well, because. You, <laughs> because <laughs> it's so stupid, doesn't it? Yeah. People, people, no, 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 don't, it's people don't know. Well, if you think about it, when that breaks down on the lake bed, yep. you see the shapes of all the, the very individual bits. Yep. And you put that on top. Exactly the same. same. Right. Because you see a lot of people, don't you? 18 mil, 20 mil, oh, red yeah. boily, yep. yellow boily. Pop ups, pop -ups. All, all sorts yeah. of things. But for pellets, it'd be a nice, small, subtle hoop bait to blend in with it all. Excellent. And then, quite simply, to mould it, obviously the, the weight's standing at the bottom. Yep. And then a little bit on top. I would fold the hoop bait link back in most situations. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later okay. when we get onto rigs. Right. A little bit on top and then quite literally start working it. As you work it you can see the pellets still keep the shape. Yep. You, know, you can still see all this nice texture, lumps yeah, and yeah, bumps. And, but with very little effort. How hard are you squeezing that so people know? Is it, you putting a lot of pressure yeah, into a lot, it? Yeah, a lot of pressure because right. what, what you want to do is get... Remember that's going to stand a lot of force when you cast. Yes. You know, it's going to be pulling through the air that way. Yep. That's that's the first unfortunate thing that happens to it, and the yeah, next yeah. thing it goes crash onto the surface of the water, and you don't want to break it up on impact. Of course. Right. You want to get it down on the bottom. Right. Okay. So you really are. You can see actually, if you look pressure in your hands. Right. You're not. Uh, you really compressed it in there, making a nice skin around the outside. That skin's the important bit. Excellent. Now. Going back onto the hook bay, right, I know that's buried inside there yeah. now. If you didn't have pellets that you could get a needle through, um, what would you use instead of that, for that mix as a hook bait? Uh, I would chop uh, a little tiny dark bit of boily right. down yep. to, to make a pellety type shape. Cool. Or a piece of pepper army. Right. And anything like that, is, it's the colour rather than anything else. Right, okay, because they're, they're eating that and the hook bait's just there and yep. it gets eaten as well. If the fish are really active, that'll lie on the bottom and the fish will actually come to it and batter it right. to, to get at it. They want to get at it. If it's a bit slower, you know, a bigger fish type of water, yep. that'll lie on the bottom and it'll break down. Yep. Rather like a PVA bag. It's a simple PVA bag. And as it breaks down, it'll release. So the fish the can then come in and yeah. gently sort of sieve over yeah. the top of it and bang, you've got him. And on, when, when you're feeding that back in there, I notice you've got a braided hook link on there. Um, is, is that on purpose or...? Yeah, it's because it's nice and soft and folds. If you, if you imagine if I was using a coated hook link and I go to fold it back, I'm actually putting a kink in it. Yeah. So you wouldn't get that movement and that fall. It, it just wouldn't quite sit right. That's a, just a nice supple braid and that's it. Right. Simple. Excellent. Right, OK, let's have a look at the next mix then. Right. Now, that was a simple mix. This is a commercially available mix. Right. Loads of different companies do them, so it really doesn't matter. Whatever what, what is this one? Because it's one of your favourites. This is a, a one called Blitz. Right. It's very, very oily. got lots of little pellets in it, lots of fish meal. Yeah. And it's very easy to use, which I like. It has to be simple for me. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. That's it as it comes? Yeah, that's it as it right. comes, straight out of the bag. Right. And what are you going to add to that then? 
Right, I've got a big flat container here, mate, and one of the reasons why I've got it is so I can mix the bait properly. Right. I want to get into all the corners. And once I add all these great things into it, mm. I want to get it all mixed around properly. So I want a big flat container. Right. Once I've mixed it, what I actually do is put in a bucket with a lid on. Right, why is that? Because I don't want it to dry out or become too wet. I mean, right. both things can Imagine it's been raining on this it session. Has been pouring well, down, if I'd yeah. have left the top off or just left it in this, I'd yeah. be this deep in water now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. no good at all. Right. So, I use this to mix and then use a sealed bucket to keep the mix in. Right. And okay. that's fine. Right, okay. But we've got some stuff here that we'll use to mix. And these, we'll start off with the liquids. This one's great. There's a commercially available one, right, okay. which is this one. As you can see, nice, fishy, strong smell to it, really good. And then this one is my own little blend. It says pineapple on the side of that, but I'm guessing it's not pineapple inside yeah, it, is it? Yeah, I think I might have been misleading everybody <laughs> slightly. This is liquidised fish. Oh, mate. Oh, uh. <laughs> I've got too much of a mouthful of that then. So what, what fish is it and how do you liquidise it? I've got sardines, mackerel, squid in there. Right. And what I do is I go to the fish mongers, yep. buy little bits and pieces of each one, yep. finely chop them with a very sharp knife, yep. and then put them in a blender. Right, OK. And you come out with this. Do you put any water with it? You can either use water, yeah. which is fine, that's a nice carrier for it. I personally use sort of the, the fish proteins, there's liquid fish proteins about there. Loads of companies do them, they all have right. different trade names. Right, and they're, they're a bulk liquid, are they, so they're not yeah. that expensive? No, they're not, not fantastically expensive. You pay about, uh, about five quid for 500 mil. Right. If you double that up with water, you, you've got quite a lot of liquid then. Right. Okay. But let's tip some of this in and get started. Now always air on this side of caution with liquids. That's gone in. That's lovely. That's the first first stage. Right. I'll keep my hands clean. I'll, I'll put a few other bits and pieces in before we start whizzing right, around. Okay. The next thing I'm going to put in is some of this. Now this is crushed, liquidised hemp. Again. An all-time classic. Yep. Absolutely fantastic. Match anglers swear by it, and now yep. carp anglers swear by it. So we'll put a little bit of that in. It goes a long way. That helps create a nice cloud in the water once the right. carp are all rooting round. Then, of course, as normal, as we all use, a bit of hemp. Just standard hemp. Yep, just standard hemp. I mean, you can cook your own if, you, if you know, price is a problem. Obviously, I'm being lazy and got a jar <laughs> of it. But there's quite a few particles in there. And the very last one, which is as cheap as you like, Budget sweet corn. Every every supermarket does it. This is about, I think, seven seventeen p a ten. Really, that and is it, so cheap. Yeah, isn't it? And, and I'm told that little Tom Dove tells me this stuff's a little bit harder than all the other stuff. Yeah, so if, you can use it for hook baits as well. If you actually it look, is, isn't it? Yeah, you if you actually that. look at it, the grains are very flat and very firm, which is really quite. No nice. good for eating, but excellent for fishing. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> nice, right, right, let's have that in there right. as well. Good bit of that in. Good dose of that. Now at this point, I've got. a a couple of little tricks up my sleeve. Right. These two little babies here. I've brushed my teeth this morning, it's all ah. right. <laughs> you wouldn't brush your teeth with this. <laughs> Take my word for it. This is anchovy paste. Again, it's very cheap. Right. It's got a very, very strong smell to it. Yep. If you, it is like toothpaste, very soft, but it's also very salty. Right. And fish love salt. Fish don't love they? salt. This is really, really cheap, and this is a good budget additive. Right. Okay. Okay. Just squeeze a little bit in there, get it in there. Lots of salt, lots of flavour. And then my other little additive is this sardines in sunflower oil. And if you just delve in, chilies. Yeah, and we all know how good chilies are. Yeah. So we'll dump that lot in as well. It'll in as soon as we start mixing it up, it'll all munch up. Right. But again, really cheap. Yep. A nice additive for everyone, a nice little trick. And then finally, just to do a few bits and pieces. We've got some standard boilies here. Right. Just normal 80 mil boilies. Well, they're no good to me. Right. They won't, they're just the wrong size. They won't bind. They too fall lumpy. off the side of the method yeah. feed or all that so sort of thing. So what we actually do is, I'm sure, I oh, can't undo it because my hand's too oily. There we go. A bait chopper. Right, so that's the, just so everyone yep. can see that. There's the chopper. Press it down. Yep, and, and that's what you get. Loads of nice little bits, bit of powder, some solid lumps, and it gives you a good hook bait option as well, just yep. in case you want to use a little bit of chopped down boilie. Right, okay. So, so that goes that in. in. 
And then finally, and by no means least, these little fellas. A good friend of mine, Martin Locke, started making these. I think that really for winter baits and PVA bags and things. Right. These lovely little six mil boilies. Yep. Again, a good hook bait, but another little particle in there, bit of flavour, another chunk. So that's it, it's all in there. Right, okay. Give that a mix up then, mate. Yep. Let's have a look at what that looks like done. Starting to just rub the fish to make sure all the all the fish is broken down. But yeah, you see, if I was mixing in a round bucket, you see, I'd, I'd be stuck, whereas I can get into the corners. Yeah. There'll be bits all over the floor yeah. and everything as well, wouldn't there? So, so we're getting it in there. We've got a nice mix going there. See, it's still nice and dry, actually. Yeah. That's one of the mistakes people make, is they, they put far too much liquid in right at the very beginning. Right. Whereas, mix it like this first, and you can play with it, and just judge whether you need any more liquid in there at all. And how long does that, you know, you said the pellets take an hour to soften up and be ready. How long does that take? That mix? This, this will be ready instantly. Really? As soon as I finish mixing it, it'll be ready to go. Right. I'll perhaps leave it five minutes just to check that... There's, you know, it hasn't dried out a little bit, you know, just mm. soaked in, but normally straight away. See, we're getting a nice blend there. You can see all the different colours and textures in it. And let's just have a... Wow, that is going into a bowl already, isn't it? And you can see how sticky it is, it's sticking on my hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Looks like boily mix almost, yeah. you know, but it's still staying in loads of little particles. But that is solid. So the... So, yeah. That's mad, isn't it? But you can, you can drop this. Doesn't go out of shape. Yeah. That, that's how firm it is. Right. And so little liquid to bind it. Right. And well, that's it, really, mate. We're ready to go with that. Right. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's two very, very good mixes for everybody to try. Really, it's only limited by imagination, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Got loads of carpy bits in there. Um, and I'm sure later on in the show, we're going to show our method rigs and baiting up and all that sort oh, of thing. Oh, yeah, as definitely. Well. Excellent. That's great. Thanks, mate. No problem. Welcome back to Thinking Tackle, and we're going to talk rigs now, uh, back in Mr Broad's swim. Um, so talk us through the, the different method feeder rigs and explain to us why you've done what you've done. No problem. This is done for ease, simplicity and safety. Right. So what I've actually got is a safe zone leader here, yep. and that serves two jobs. One, it helps keep the end rig pinned to the lake bed. Right. And the second job it does, it protects the fish's side. Right. I don't want to lift any scales off the fish, and if I was running just straight line through there, I could possibly just lift a scale, and I don't really want to do that. Sure. So when I've set this up, I've quite simply got the safe zone leader, and I've threaded a six-inch piece of nylon through the loop, and that's helped me pull the leader through the inside of the, the right. feeder, okay. just to make it nice and easy. Because you can't push it through, no, can you? No, no. So, yeah. Just pulled it through, and then I've sat the ring swivel that we can see here. I'll just get a little pointer. This ring swivel that's sat in there so it can still pull off and yep. the feeder can be ejected from the rig. Yep. Uh, but what that, that does is it gives me plenty of movement because I want to fold this hoop rig, hoop link, all the way back into the feeder when I form my ball. So I want that bit of movement, so that's why there's a ring on there. Right, so it's a standard ring swivel, safe zone yep. leader, pulled through the middle of the method feeder, it's semi-fixed in there. Yep. If the line was unfortunately to break, the fish is dragging the feeder around, it'll, it'll pull out yep. and it will slide completely off yep. the end. And I, it's something worth pointing out that people try and test these things dry in yeah, their it hands. it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No, 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 no. You have to get it really soaking wet and, yeah. and the ease that it'll all pull apart is well, it makes a huge yeah. difference, doesn't it? And people, people test them in the shop and go, oh, no, I don't like that. Oh, yeah. oh it's but too stiff, that. How many rigs have you ever used dry? <laughs> we tend to chuck them in the wet stuff, yeah. so they have to work like that, don't no, they? definitely. Right, and hook link-wise, talk us through how you actually tie it, what order it gets tied in, and what the different components are. Right, well, we'll start opposite end now, mate. Right, OK. What we've done is we've formed a loop in the end of just a piece of uh, sinking braid. This is actually 15-pound Nash bullet braid, which I love as hook links. Right, which is a real line. It's a real line, but I use it for hook links. Right, okay, cool. Yeah, so I formed a loop in the end, that's my hair hair loop. And then I've threaded on a single grain of maize. Yep. Finished it off with this little tiny pop-up. It's one of the everlasting ones that right. Lockie does. Right. And then obviously a hair stop. What that actually does is just give the whole thing a little bit of buoyancy. Just lightens it up a little bit so it moves about a bit more naturally. Goes in their mouth yeah. a bit easier as and well. And it's the right colour as well. Yeah. Wicked, okay. And then quite simply, we've come used a size 10 wide gate. Yep. And we've just knotless knotted it straight to the wide gate. Okay. Sim simple as that. Yep. 
added a piece of shrink tube and you'll notice that the piece of shrink tube is just one piece. I've got no ring, no blowback sleeve, no nothing, just that one piece. Well, why is that? Because if there's a lot of nuisance fish in your lake, yep. they're going to be pecking at your method ball all the time and potentially they could move anything about and just you... foul the presentation. Yep. So I want it to be as effective as I can but as bomb proof as I can. Yeah. Uh, once we've shrunk that you know, in the steam and, and formed this nice angle there which helps the hook turn and it increases the gape of the hook there. So it's, so it's able to grab the flesh yeah, basically. Yeah. Right, as okay. the fish is feeding, as soon as it picks it up and moves away, the weight of the rig helps it pull into the bottom lip. Right. It helps it all turn over. Okay. And we've quite simply we've come down a nice short rig. This one's about four inches, which is just perfect for me to fold back. Right. And uh, tied it with a grinner straight to the ring swivel. Okay, so basically when you're changing the rig, you just cut that one off yep. and then tie another yep. grinner knot. Just cut it off, because you, you're working so short all the time, and I don't want any clips and encumbrances there. It's right. just nice and simple. Tied just straight onto that. Right, okay. Now, how important is the sinking braid? If people are using a braid which is neutral buoyancy or even floating, does that make a difference with method feeder fishing or not? Not, not really. The only thing I would say is I'd worry about it getting tangled up in the mechanics of the feeder. Right. Yeah, if it's looped up yeah. around the feeder, it's a mental problem. It mentally doesn't appeal to me. You want it, yeah. when it starts to unfold, you want it all to lay yeah, flat on the bottom? Completely. Right, OK. All right, and then t talk to us about the next one down. That's, that's the pellet. Right, well, we'll get rid of this one. Right. That, well, we've talked about that. That's, that's one done. This is the pellet one. The setup's still exactly the same. We've still got the same sinking leader. Everything is exactly the same. Right. And we would obviously mould a ball of pellet around this feeder and fold this Lucalite pellet hoop bait back in. Right, so it's effectively the same rig as you've just showed yep. us, you've just changed the different the, the yep. hook bait. And when you're fishing, say you've got three rods out, fishing the method on every rod, will you have a different hook bait on every rod? Will you have the same one I on will, every rod? Yeah, I will swap and change, because just on one of those awkward days, well, like today... <laughs> and yesterday. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't rub it in. Um, <laughs> You just might find one little thing that will give you that edge, that will get right. you that bite, and you can swap all the rods to it, and all of a sudden, whoa. Right. And it could be something really silly, like putting a piece of fake corn on top of that pellet. Yeah, so it's just tipped off with yeah. it. Yeah, uh, it could be just something as small as that right. will make the difference between getting a bite on a really hard day and blanking. Right, so what would you say are your probably four or five favourite hook baits uh, to be fished with a method? Well, obviously, balanced maize, which we talked yep. about. Pellet lookalikes. Yeah. We've got fake maize there, which we'll talk about in a second. And there's other things like you can use little cut down bits of boily yep. to match what we put in the method mix. And even pepper army. Right. A another great bait, another supermarket bait that's just an you, you should never never go fishing without some pepper army in your rucks. Exactly. Ever. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um so talk to us about this next one then, because you've got a shot on there. Let's just move mm. that over next to that one there's a split shot on there so yep. is that a pop-up or uh, well it's sort of critically balanced what i've got you see is that's an actually a long shank hook yeah and it's a big one it's actually a size eight right okay. and it's just enough to critically balance that so it would actually hover just, right just like that right okay but what i want is the reason why the anchor shot's been added is just to help it pin it down that little bit more right not to make it a pop-up just to help it just so it doesn't waft around too much Right, OK. So what, why have that one, which is hard on the bottom, that pellet there, and then that one wafting around? What, ah. what, when would you fish the different ones? This one is for fishing outside the ball. Right, OK. Right. We've talked about these. These are all baits that have been folded back in. Right. This one will actually be fished outside the ball. Why is that? Well, it's, it's about getting a quick bite. Right. Um, if you imagine it, you've cast it out, you sank it down on tight line, bump, it's hit the bottom, the method feeder's there, Yep. You've got the hook link extended and that's sitting there on the bottom. Right. As the method feeder breaks down and creates a nice circle, that's just on the edge of the circle and as the fish comes in, it's likely to be one of the first things that he picks up. Right. It's almost like a bit that's fallen off yeah. on the way down. Yeah. That sort of thing. And do you, I mean, Frank said to me when he fishes with a method that, that fishing it outside seems to be better for the bigger fish and the smaller fish, he, he's got it folded back. The more hungry waters, he's got it folded in the yeah, bowl. Is that, yeah. is that, do you fish the same way or, or not? I, I haven't arrived at that because of that reason, because of the size of fish. I've, I've arrived at it because of speed of bite. Right, OK. Sometimes, if, you, if you're getting takes really quickly, <laughs> the method ball doesn't even have to dissolve, really, or yeah. break down. 
the hook bait's there, they're attracted to all, the, all that oil and smell coming from the method ball, and that's the first thing they see. Right. And they just pick it up. It's a way for me of getting a quick bite. Right. But to be fair to Frank and his thinking, I have had a lot of big fish on it, so... Yeah, mm, with, it, with it outside yeah. the ball? Yeah. Right, OK, cool. Now, I know... I'm pretty knackered now because I had a few hours kip last night, but you had no kip no. last night. You were up all night re-chucking again and again and again. Um, you know, do you have to put that much effort into it all the time? Or, you know, what made you do it last night? Um, it was building the swim. Right. Obviously, I was struggling. You, you had a, a reasonable night and morning. Well, I had one bite in <laughs> yeah. the evening. I had one bite in the morning and a funny occurrence at night. It wasn't of... It hasn't exactly... Uh, been mental, is it? You no. know, but um, but you know, what? Why? Why keep doing that right well, the way through? I look at it. It's this is almost like a little mini spot, right? So you spot over the top of your baits to yep. keep the swim topped up. Yeah. You know, if you happen to wake up in the middle of the night and you've got the, you'll go out. Another half a dozen spots go out. Absolutely. Well, for me, it's a method feeder. Right. My lines are marked, which is an important thing. I've obviously put the marker float out. Yeah. I felt. I've actually just fished off the gravel, whereas you're fishing on it. Yep. I've just come just to one side of it. I've cast out and then I've marked the lines. Right, and, and how, how have you marked them? How do you do that? Well, I use pole elastic. Right. Uh, it's very soft and, as it says, elastic, so it stretches, and you can tie a little stop knot with it, and you just form a loop on the line, go down, 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 through the loop, and pull it tight. Almost like a, like a grinner, but along yep. the line sort yep. of thing. And then cut, cut the tag in yep. short or leave them long? Yeah. Cut them short. Come short, right. nice and neat, and it's fine. That's perfect for recasting. And I can then just put the line in the clip, yep. mould a method ball on, cast out to your mark, bump, down. And that's it all the time, and I can keep the process going. Right. It's bang on the money every time, and there's bait going in, going in, going in, building right. and building all so the time. So even if you're not baiting up independently, if you're not getting bites, you're leaving, as you pull that method feeder yep. in, you're leaving bait yep. on the spot, on the spot, on the spot. You know, and the longer that happens, the more working. chance there is of... Working the swim all the time, working right. the swim. Right, OK. Excellent stuff. And putting this, the actual balls out, how many, how many different ways do you use to actually put the, the method... Oh, you know, the, the, the free offerings yeah, out, as it the, were? There's several different ways. Uh, if I want it really tight, yep. I would use a spod. Right, OK. Because that's really accurate. Uh, whatever the range, it's really accurate. Yeah, because you're clipping it yeah. up at the distance and keep dropping it on that yeah. same spot. Right, if okay. I want to fish a spread of bait, so fish are coming across a dissolved ball here, a dissolved ball there, a dissolved ball there, yeah. I use one of the casting pouches. Right. And quite literally, although they're fairly accurate, you'll get a nice spread, sort of tennis court size of 20 balls. Right, So okay. the fish can move about. Right, OK. And that's for range stuff, really, yeah. isn't it? Right, and then closer in? Catapult or scoop. Right, so the old hand of God, as we yeah. call it. Yeah. Right, OK. And what, what sort of range would a catapult work up to? 30 to 60. Right. And then anything, the same with the scoop. You can perhaps push it a little bit further with the scoop, but anything really over 60 yards, it's spod or casting pouch. Or the casting pouch. Right, OK. And on a session like this, how many would you put in to start off with? On, on these sort of really highly pressured, you know, heavily stocked venues, what do you start off with? I would start off with about a dozen balls or a dozen spods. Right to start with and then I would recast every half an hour. Right, what, every single rod every half, or just one rod every half an hour? You can work it in rotation, it depends. Right. I, I tend to do it so it keeps you busy and, and active. I, I tend to stagger it so I'm every half an hour and do two or three rods. Right. And just keep it going, keep it going. The fish don't mind, it's food, it's a dinner bell to them. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, well, that's loads of good information. I'm sure you'll, you'll keep at it. We've got another night to go, haven't yeah. we? So uh, the fish seem to be on the surface over in that calm water <laughs> yeah. at the moment, don't they? Just all laughing at us. But uh, when that sun drops down and the, and the temperature drops a bit, I reckon there's every chance they're going to come back yeah. in on the spot again. So uh, hopefully we'll get some more tonight. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to Thinking Tackle. And uh, Mr. Broad has pulled one out of the bag. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. In very, very tough conditions. There's been hardly any fish caught at all. Um, I've not had anything last night either. And uh, one of the methods roared off, didn't it, this morning? Yes. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, let's get him out and have a Great, look at him. Mate. Another little dumpy one. Yeah, lovely fella. Lovely little fella, though. Ooh. Get this out of the way. 
pack a little fish, mate. <laughs> Excellent, mate. Wicked. Saved the day, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Saved the day. And this is what we were talking about. When Steve was saying he always uses something behind the method feeder to protect the fish, when you're playing the fish, that's rubbing against the side of the fish there. And if you just add line on, it could easily flick those scales. See them beautiful scales yeah. he's got down his side there? The line could get under those and flick those off. And once they come off, it's going to take forever for them to grow back, isn't it? So, Unfortunately, yeah. You know, so from a fish care point of view, the method feed is not going to tangle because the hook link's folded back inside it. But from a fish care point of view, always have something behind the feeder. Right, mate, hoist her up. Let's, let's see the prize on a very difficult session. Steady. Lovely fish, aren't they? Look at that. Look at that. At last. At last. <laughs> <laughs> the, pre work. the pressure was seriously on there, mate. Seriously wasn't it? was. Wicked. Oh, cracking. Excellent. Right, let's get her back. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm going to get on with my rigs. We're going to have a look at my successful rigs now while uh, Mr. Broad is still spodding over the top of his rigs. But we're going to talk about that in a minute. First of all, let's have a look at these because these are the ones that I caught the fish on. Now, it's a different kind of rig to what you've seen in the show before, and it's tied ever so slightly different. I've started off by bending the eye in slightly on a size 8 wide gape hook, and that's because I'm not using any shrink tube there by the eye to kick the hook link in anymore. So that's going to turn really well just by bending that in just a tiny amount. And I've tied the knotless knot there, but I've done it in a slightly different way. I've done two turns of the knotless knot, and then I've wrapped the hair backwards and then kept doing the knot further up the shank so it's trapped the, knot, the actual hair in the middle of the knotless knot. Rather than coming out the top there, it's actually coming out the middle of the knotless knot. And then I've tied the loop for my hair rig on there, as, a, as I do normally, and then added a tiny split shot. That's a number four split shot to it. And then put on a couple of bits of just plastic sweet corn. That's the pineapple and embuteric stuff that I nicked off of Frank Warwick when I went fishing with him last December. And that's caught me loads and loads of fish. And the reason that I moved over to that, I started off with this one, with a piece of maize just straight out of my spod mix and a little tiny bit of yellow foam underneath it, exactly the same hooking arrangement with a little tiny shot on it. So it's basically gonna sit like that. Just a little bit up off the bottom because I noticed out there, that's a bit of maize that I'd been using. And can you see how dark that is? It's gone really black, that bit of maize. And although I've cast out my marker float, pulled it back until I felt a little tiny bit of gravel out there, I'm fishing quite a bit further than anybody else. I've let the float up to the top and fished on top of just the edge of the gravel. Now you'd think that there wouldn't be any silt out there, but there obviously is because that bit of maize has been stained black. So I found each time I was winding in, even after three or four hours, the maize had gone black and I thought, well, that's tainted the smell of that. So I moved over to the plastic baits instead because they don't seem to go black, they don't take on the smell of the silt and that pineapple and embuteric smell is still in them when I wind it back in again. I caught the first fish on maize, even though the maize had gone black, and then the second fish I caught was on the two bits of, of pineapple and embuteric. And you see there I've got a stripped away section on that coated hook link. This is a softer coated hook link. This is a prototype that we might be bringing out next year. If you want to use something like this in the meantime, I'd say Cortex is a very good one for doing the same as this. And the reason I'm using this softer hook link is because the bottom is a little bit silty out there, even though I'm feeling the gravel, I don't want the hybrid that I normally use might be sticking up straight out of the bottom like that because the lead's gone in a little bit and it's pushing the hook link up. So this is a nice dark green colour which is going to blend in really well and it's going to sit nice and flat to the bottom. And then going down to the lead system, I've basically got, if I can just pull that out of there for you, I've got a standard lead clip with a safe zone leader running through the middle of it, but I've altered it. What I've done is I've cut the ring swivel off the end there and just replaced that with a quick link. And then my link loop, which is, has been tied just with a half blood knot onto the end of the hook link, is just clipped onto that link loop. And when I pull that inside, I've squeezed that that uh, lead clip there a little bit so that that will pull inside under just a tiny amount of tension but there's no way you see there there's no way that that link loop can get back off of there on the cast or when I'm playing a fish or anything else it can't get back off and the reason I've done that rather than using it as a normal lead clip is as soon as I get a bite that is going to pull out of there like that and we noticed on the underwater films when the fish feels the weight of the lead it shakes its head and if the lead stays put if it's semi fixed sometimes they can actually throw the hook out of their mouth so by doing that as they shake their head the lead just slides 
away from the fish and there's no anchor point for them to throw the hook. And then to stop it coming off the end of the leader, I've just pulled on a little tiny safe zone four mil rubber bead and all that's doing is slowing the lead down because as the fish charges off that lead's going to slide down the leader and if it comes off the end of the leader during the fight it ends up sliding back down the line and ended up on top of the leader and it's a bit weird when you're playing a fish so that bead just slows it down if the line unfortunately snaps that bead will push off the end and the lead will come off the end of the leader and all the fish is carrying around is that leader so it's nice and safe. The other thing that I'm doing differently to most people on here is I'm using back leads. Even though I'm fishing a long way out, probably about 100 yards, I'm still putting a back lead on because the water's about 15 feet deep out there and if you've got tight lines going straight down to the rig, they're cutting right through the middle of the swim. There's 30 odd swims in here. If everybody's doing that and then you've got back leads on and all your lines pinned to the bottom, there's more chance of the fish feeding in your area. And there's not many people that have caught fish off the bottom while we've been fishing. Even though this is a prolific lake, it's not been fishing very well at all. Now, now, I've given it till probably mid-morning now with the bottom bait rigs. Nothing's happened on the second night. The fish are up on the surface. We've seen them since early this morning that they're moving around on the top. So I'm going to change over from a bottom bait rig to a zig rig. And I'm going to whack that out just for the last half a day, put some spot out over the top of it, and try and get the fish feeding in mid-water and actually catch them off the bottom. So let's get that cast out and see if we can get another bite. Beautiful. Well, that is all we've got time for in this episode of Thinking Tackle. Steve and I are going to keep on working the swims over the top of the zig rigs, see if we can get a couple of bites in these really poor conditions. Thank you very much to Mr Broad. And it goes for his insight into method fishing. I'm sure that's going to get us loads of bites when the fish are actually having it. We're going to carry on working, and I'm sure you'll see us on the bank somewhere else later on in the season. For a chance to see more of the underwater footage shown in this series, check out the state-of-the-art underwater carp fishing series, available from all good tackle shops. This episode of Thinking Tackle is in association with Daiwa Infinity Rods.